Thank you, Jesus. Wow, what a great day. What a great day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start in Philippians chapter uh, 3 um, just briefly. We were there last week. I'm going to just start there, and then we're going we're gonna to move on a little bit. We started, uh, we started last week uh, sharing a message, um, and, and I don't know how many of these are going to be, but I, I know probably at least more than, more than a couple. But we started talking about pressing on, pressing on, continuing on. Moving forward, if you will. And we started at some series of messages on pressing on. And, and I got this. I kind of started from the text in Philippians chapter 3, where uh, verse 14, bro, uh, Paul speaking, said, Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, means, meaning, hey, I'm not there yet. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't arrived. He said, but this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind and I reach forth unto those things which are before me. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And he, he basically began to say, listen, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not perfect. I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't made it. I, I don't do everything right. I, I don't have everything the way I wish it was. But this one thing I am doing, I'm forget the past. How many of you can say amen for that one? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> forget the past, and I press on. And that's where we're at this morning. We're, we, we, we started talking about what it meant to press on and, and what it meant to, to move forward. And we, we, we started last week talking about one of the first things that Jesus did. So remember, Jesus came to the earth. He begins to, to share the, the good news of the gospel and, and the salvation and, and, and man being reunited with God. And he began to explain all this. And then after his death, he meets with the disciples and he said, what I want you to do is I want you to wait for the promise of the Father. It says you need to be endued with power. Okay? And, and one of the things that we find, at least for me, because I tried so hard to be a Christian. I wanted to be a Christian. I wanted to be right. You know, I wanted to do good. Any of you ever want to do good and not do good? Just me? I wanted to be good. I did. I wanted to do right. I wanted to, to do what I was supposed to do. And then it would just seem like I just did it. Don't look at me like that. Tell me like, really, you bad. Man. I was. I was a bad person. What well, you know? And so the thing is that I wanted to do good and just seemed like I couldn't make it. And there's something that I needed. I needed God to empower me. I needed something above me. And so that's what Jesus was telling his disciples. He said, I want you to wait. I want you to wait here until you've been empowered. And so the disciples, when Jesus had died, right? He died, and he resurrected from the dead. He comes back. He comes in. He sees them. They're all standing. I mean, they're there. They actually see Jesus after the crucifixion. They're having these conversations with him. They're, can you imagine? They're on fire. They're excited, and the first thing he tells them to do is don't do anything. Just wait. You need empowered. All right, and so that's kind of where we started last week with the idea that God wants to empower us, that we need to be empowered with God. We started talking about, about uh, last week a little bit about uh, finding God, the reality of God. There are many people who, who they, 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 you know, there's an idea that there's a God. They, they know some people believe in God, but they haven't had a reality, real, to, uh, an, an encounter where they know there's a God. And we started talking a little bit about encountering God, about finding God, about seeking God. And so that's kind of where we're uh, going to kind of kick off here, um, is that we, there's a, this important, the, the necessity of us to be empowered. And then in Isaiah, it begins to talk about, and I shared a little bit with you last week about how that God says, you know, those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, they'll they'll fly with wings of eagles they'll run and not get weary this is what we need if we're going to press on we need to be empowered i don't know about you i can't do this on my own you wimp yeah <laughs> i can't do it on my own i've tried and i fail it doesn't work i need something else and and i'm excited about the next kind, kind of the next one we're talking about empowerment and maybe uh, next week i'm hoping to be talking about encouragement because i need that too come on you know, so, but, but this, but we need to be empowered. We need God to do something in our lives. 
And so, uh, I'm in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 is where I'm going to kind of get kicked off here. Um, we kind of left off here last week. And so, um, I'm getting going to start here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 23. Except there is no 23 in Hebrews chapter 4. So that'd be verse 1. Hebrews 4, chapter 1. All right, so um, uh, maybe, and I don't remember if we covered this last week, so in Acts chapter 4, the disciples were, they were going out and they were preaching, they, they had been empowered, they're going out preaching, and then the, the, the rulers, the big shots, the, the, the chief priests, the, the, preachy pe- the churchy people, believe it or not, it was the churchy people that were causing all the problems, it's weird. Believe it or not, it was, it was the churchy people, the, the religious people that were causing the problems. And so they, they started coming against the disciples, and you have to stop that. You can't be talking like that, and if you keep doing that, if you keep talking about this Jesus, we're going to throw you in jail. And so they went out, and they, they met, they got together, and they started praying, and they're like, Lord, listen to what they're saying. They said, behold what they're threatening us with. They're telling us to stop doing what you've said we should do. And uh, they said, give us boldness. Once again, they're saying that we need to be empowered. We need empowerment to do what we feel like you want us to do. And the Bible says that, that they, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and that the Lord moved upon them and the place began to shake. That'd be fun. Some of you would run, wouldn't you? The first thing out of your mouth would be, earthquake. I'd be like, no, it's Jesus, stay. No. Yeah. He'd be like, you're crazy. No. But, but the, you know, they experienced God. God began to move and they experienced God. And the Bible says that they then got up from there empowered and began to go forth. Okay. And so that's where, you know, we, we need this. We need to be empowered. I need to be empowered. I, I got to tell you something. I work a full-time job. I have a family. I, I, have, a, I have a life, I, you know, being pastor and all of the other things. I need empowered. I can't do this on my own. I need this. I need God to refresh and rebuild and renew in me. Now, I've had a lot of experiences with God. I could, I could tell you stories all day long about the things God has done for me. All right, I could, but I still need him to do at least one more. <laughs> Maybe a lot more before it's all over. I still need empowered today to move ahead and go forward. All right, Hebrews chapter four, verse one. All right. So Paul beginning to teach something, and I don't want to get too in-depth in it or get too much into all of the details of this because there's a lot of stuff in here that we're going to kind of skip over, but I don't, I want to, I'm not trying to take it out of context. It's just there's a lot in this chapter, okay? The Bible starts out with, Let us fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Basically, he's saying here, and this is, this is not like be afraid, like be shaking in a corner, I'm afraid. But he said, listen, be concerned, if you will, that there's a promise that God has for you that you might not get. Listen, you have no problem with this, with this when you're a child, right? There's not an issue here. If there's presents under the tree and somebody is opening presents, you're expecting one. Right? And if there isn't one, you want to know where yours is at. All right? We have no problem with that. We have no problem with that. You're going around and hand a popsicle to one kid. I dare you. Hand a popsicle to one kid. What do they want to know? Whoa, 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 whoa. Where's mine? I need a popsicle. Okay? And yet somehow in the things of God, we see people who God has begun to move in their life, and we go, oh, that's good for them. No way, dude, I want the whole thing. Amen. If God's gonna move anywhere, I want him to do it in me. Amen. If God's presence is real, if his anointing is real, if God's gonna touch anybody, I want mine. And this is where Paul starts out in this verse. He said, be, a, be, be concerned that, you, that there might be a promise that you might miss out on. Okay, I like it because I'm, I'm kind of selfish and I want them all, all right? So, and, and then he begins to, to go on and, and he says, for, for unto us was the gospel preached the same as them, but the word did not profit them being mixed 
being not mixed with faith in them that heard it. See, this is interesting. So uh, he's saying, listen, it's the same message. We're in the same church service. And you know how many times I've seen this? The message will come out and, and the preacher will preach and somebody over there is like, God, it, God touched me. And somebody over here is like, man, that preacher is boring. Put me to sleep, snore. <sighs> really? You know, wow, that was horrible. Get nothing. You're like, did were we at the same church? Okay, were we at the same place? And so the, the, the idea here is, and, and those of you who have been, if you've been around God very long, you're gonna, the reality of God is so powerful. And as you recognize the reality that God is real, and he begin, we talked about this last week, and that God begins to show himself to you, when, as you begin to get this reality, the word takes on a different meaning because then you begin to experience God, you know it's God, you hear it, and your faith is such that when it comes, you're able to receive that word and it becomes life-changing to you. And to others, the word doesn't change them at all, all right? And that's what we're talking about. If the word isn't changing you, if church means nothing to you, if you go to church and or you see all these religious people and nothing is happening in you, if it was me, I would be afraid that I might miss something. Well, Baz or Dale, they just don't want me to have any fun. And that simply is not true. <laughs> okay? Not true. The idea here is that Paul is beginning to give out a warning for those who would not get theirs. Who wouldn't get theirs. Uh, two weeks ago, I began to share with you, God has an ulterior motive. God has an ulterior motive. God's ulterior motive is he doesn't want you to go to hell. And he loves you. Amen. So Pastor Dale, what's your ulterior motive? You know, I, I, don't, I don't really have an ulterior motive to, as far as, as you're concerned. My ulterior motive is to please him who's what he's done for me. See, you, what you do, what your decisions, whether you, I shared a couple of weeks ago, I don't remember, two or three weeks ago, that if you choose God or don't choose God, I am still going to heaven whether you do or not. And Paul's message wasn't, I'm not gonna go. Paul's message was, you should be concerned as to whether or not you are going to get yours. Okay, so when we begin to talk about pressing on and moving forward, I wanna recognize, I want you to understand that if you're gonna get yours, if you're gonna get what God has for you, if your life is gonna change, if things are gonna drastically move for you, you're going to have to go get yours. Okay, all right. So Paul goes on and he begins to talk about uh, entering into Christ, in, into Christ and entering into rest and he begins to talk a little bit about the Sabbath day. I don't really want to dive into that because I, I, I don't, I don't want to get sidetracked at where we're at, but it's still in the same context. He comes down to about verse 11, all right, and he says, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Listen, I don't know about you, but I need God. I have tried this on my own. It did not work. I've had people say, well, that's good if you need it. Well, I do. All right, I do. And so uh, because of that, I don't want to miss. I don't want to miss out. I don't want to miss out on the promises. I, I, want, I want to press in. I, want, I don't want to miss this promise. And then we get in, let us labor to enter into that rest, recognizing something that if somebody is offering you something for free, aren't you normally a little bit suspicious? Absolutely. I share with you, I, got, I, I won like $2 million. I did. I won $2 million. They called me and said, hey, you just won $2 million. It was sweet. The only one, it was like $195 at, for bank fees. And if I'd send them the $195 and my checkings account numbers, they'd put the $2 million in my account. So, so it was a fantastic deal, right? Sure. Yeah, that's a no. <laughs> that's a no. I'm automatically suspicious, Okay. And so that, that, isn't, that isn't necessarily, that's not a bad thing. And so God, we hear a lot about, well, listen, man, it's all, it's all free. It's all free. It's all free. It's all free. And let me tell you something. There, the God, he forgives. He loves you. He loves you just like you are. But let's be honest. You kind of smell bad, spiritually speaking. And I'm not looking at you. I always get myself in trouble. I was preaching one time. One guy got me. You're just looking right at me. Uh, no, I'm not. My eyesight is bad. I can't even hardly see you from up here. All right? I wasn't looking at you. But the truth is that we 
we know in our heart, we know where we're at. And so God is trying to get through to us, and we know that we're, we need him to help us make it through. And, and he loves us, he accepts us, he, he wants to help us, but he wants to see us change. And God has a tendency, whether you know this or not, to lay out in front of us, Here, here's something for you to have, but if you're gonna get it, you're gonna have to go, you're gonna have to fight a little bit to get it. You're gonna have to work a little bit for it, you know? You're going to have to work a little bit. The Bible tells us that uh, when God sent out the children of Israel, and, and this is historically provable, and, and they were in slavery, and he sent them out into the land. He said, I'm going to give you this land. It's your land. You can do with whatever you want with it. He said, go get it. He said, have, you're my people. I'm going to be your God. You're going to win wars. You're going to conquer this land. You're going to take care of it. These guys are out here. They've planted gardens, and you're going to get to eat of the gardens you didn't even plant of. Sounds good, right? God did this. Historically, he did this in the nation of Israel. He said, go get it. So the people of Israel, the army of Israel, which wasn't really an army, they're just a bunch of slaves, they begin to go out. But then he says something. He says, but what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to drive out every enemy in one year. He said, I'm going to leave your enemy in your land. Isn't that a nice God? I'm going to leave the enemy in your land. And you're going to have to go kick them out. Okay? That's what he told them. And somehow we think, if I just come to church, God's going to get me, touch me, change me, and I'll be a different person. How many of you know that is not true? How many people know people in church that are not good people? Don't look at me. All right? The bottom line is, going to church doesn't make you good. You could amen louder. All right. Does it? There are people who claim religion, but they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't dig in. They, they're, they're just kind of surface people. All right? But that's not who I want to be. I want to be genuinely knowing God, changed by God, a new life, a new place, with, empowered by God. I want to be a whole new thing. Okay? That's not, a, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I want to be that guy that God has changed. And if I'm going to be the guy that God has changed, it is not going to be easy. <laughs> it's going to be work. It's going to be labor. And that's what he was saying here. If you want to be changed, you're going to have to work at it. This can't just be something that you just, it just, it just can't be something you put in your head once and now you're there. You need to fight for it. And here's the next thing. Do you know why he left the enemy in the land in front of Israel? Do you know why? Anybody? Remember all those gardens they planted? You ever had a garden? What happens in gardens? Weeds. Weeds and work. God left the enemy there in the land to take care of the garden until the people of Israel got big enough to be able to take care of it when they got it. See, if God just wiped all the enemy out, all of those gardens and all those things that those people had planted would have went desolate and the plants would have died. God left the enemies there because that's what it was going to take for that, that thing that is mine will be taken care of until I can actually take, possess it in myself. Okay? Labor. I need God. I need his empowering. And the question really comes to the fact is do you and are you willing to pay the price to experience God? Are you willing to do it? You know, and anybody tells you there's not a price, it, it, come on, you know better than that. You can't, sir. God spoke, all right, and created the heavens. And he doesn't owe you anything. Just saying. And he has laid up a system. He will bless you. He will change you. Trust me. God has drastically changed my life. All right? I, I'm, I, don't, I, I, I shared with you my testimony last week. I don't, I don't want to do that again this week. But I'm going to tell you something. God has drastically changed who I am. <laughs> I'm not who I used to be, but it is going to require a willingness on your part to seek him, to look for him, all right? Moving on down, and, and I'm just, I'm kind of skipping around. Um, it talks about how that Christ suffered. You know, why do we, 
our God, the reason that God did what he did, Jesus, who is God and who is our God, came to earth to experience this life and this pain and the same problems you experience so that he could identify with you on a way that, that a God who's up in heaven could never really identify by experiencing the pain of life here, okay? And he did that so that he could really identify with us and be there with us as, as a true brother, Okay? But verse 16, it says, Therefore, let us come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Bible talks, uh, and the Bible talks about that as children, if you come to Christ as children, you'll find him. You know why? You ever seen a kid in trouble? Screaming bloody murder. And I had one that, 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 that every time he'd see blood, I'm not looking at any of my children that are here. He would see blood. It didn't matter how much blood. It was like, he's dead. We knew he was dead. The scream that would come out. But he got our attention. Right? See, children understand better than we do. If you need God, if you need God to drastically change your life, don't go to God with this whole, hey God, if you can, would you help me? <laughs> you, know, if you, you know, if you want to do something, just go ahead. No, hold on. It's like, help! <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Dale, you're being silly. No, I'm not. Because with the intensity that you seek God, God seeks you. The Bible says, with the measure you meet shall be measured back to you again. Give and it shall be given unto you. And everybody's telling you things I'm talking about money. I'm not. Matter of fact, those scriptures aren't talking about money. It's talking about you. Give and he will give to you. Pour out yourself and he will pour out to you. If I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. All right? The simple fact is that if you want God, you need to get a little bit a grown up about it. I'm smiling. I'm not looking at you, but I am. You need to be a little bit grown up about it and realize that God will help you change your life. God wants to change your life. God wants to be a part of your life, but he wants you to actually, truly commit to the fact that you want him to do it and that you're willing to pay the price to receive it in your life. When my marriage got bad, and it got bad, as most marriages will after if you, you know, I mean, they just do. Some, some, for some reason, there are some people just married forever and everything's perfect. That was not me. When my marriage got bad and I began to weigh my options, what do I do? Do I quit? Do I give up? What do I do? I don't know what to do. We had, we had kids. I was like, do I just, I, I don't want to be a deadbeat dad, but, but I want to be there for my kids, but I don't know if I can stand living with that woman anymore. And I'm weighing my options. I mean, don't look at me like that. I'm being honest with you. I was weighing my options. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me out of his word, and he told me to love her, to love her. And I thought, man, this is, yeah, whoo, that's going to be tough. But you said to do it, and I'm going to give it a try, you know. And, and I've shared that story with you. I, I read every book I could get my hand on. I found every marriage tape I could find. I, I dug, I dug, I dug. I, anybody, if you had a marriage CD, book, training, teaching, whatever, I wanted it. I needed help. And I was serious because I made a decision I'm going to stay. And if I'm going to stay, I am. And, and marriage is hard, right? It's hard. If it's bad, it's hard. If it's good, uh, let me tell you, it's still hard. <laughs> you know? Did you know good marriages are hard just as hard? They're, they're hard. Okay? It's still hard to have a good marriage. It requires something from you. This is no different. We say we want God to move. I want God to change me. I want God to do something. Then you need to understand it will be hard. And you need to put some effort into it. You, you should amen me. That was good preaching. Thank you. That was good preaching. A couple of you are like, don't, 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 not me. I ain't amen in that. That means I got to go to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Put some effort into it. I began to see, I found everything I could. You know, some of it didn't work. Did you know? I mean, some of it wasn't for me, and some of it didn't fit our situation. It didn't help me. Sure, but some of it did. And God changed my marriage, and it's phenomenal, and I love it. And, and it's, I don't know, a lot of years now. Get in trouble, 28. You know, God's done a phenomenal thing there. But, but it wasn't because I was, it wasn't because I just rolled over and said, God, make it good. God, make my life good. 
That is the prayer. I'm telling you, that's the prayer we pray. God, make my life good. All right? Will you seek him? We get to worship. We won't worship. won't raise my hands. But God, make my life good. I'll go to church once in a while. I won't read my Bible. But God, make my life good. I won't really actually study the Bible. I won't really reach out and try to find you. I'm going to pray, but only when I'm in trouble. Uh, once again, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> but God, make my life good. We need to come to a whole new level of understanding of, 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 of what it's going to take to see God move. All right? And it is going to take some work. I want God to move in my life. It's going to take some commitment for me. You know, God wants my time. God wants me, he wants me to pay attention to him in the mornings. He wants me to read my Bible. He wants me to study my word. He wants me to put that in. He wants me to try to find him. He wants me to look for him. Have you ever met, you know, the thing is, it's interesting, guys. Did you know that most women really do want to be pursued? And I'm talking in a good way, positive way. They want a man who pursues them, you know, who cares, who tries to reach out to them. They, they want that. They want it. And, and in all honesty, so, so do we. we. We want that. As guys, we want that. We want somebody who's into us. You know, it's no fun in a relationship with somebody who doesn't really act into you. Just saying. And yet we expect God to be into us even though we're not into him. It's totally true. I want God to do something for me. I want to have a, him to have a relationship with me, but I'm just going to act like I'm cool. It's cool. We're good. Me and God, we're tight. I don't talk to him. I don't pray. I don't try to find him. I'm not even really serious in my heart. I'm pretending. I'm acting it out. I'm trying to jump through these hoops. I'm just trying to do what is necessary. Come on. Just give me the, just give me what do I have to do? Listen, if you do just what you have to do, you're only going to get just this much. I was, I, I was in, in sports, and, and I was in, in state for wrestling year after year, and, and, and it was a really, you know the difference between the state champion wrestlers and everybody else? One of the things that the states did, we typically ran a little longer than everybody else. Coach would say, we're going to run up there and back. Every, the whole team would run up there and back, but those winners who wanted to win, we'd run a little farther. Why would you run a little farther? Because I want to win. And I'm going to tell you something. If you play at this God thing, if you just kind of dib, nibble around the edges, if you just kind of reach in and just play with it, that's all you're ever going to experience, and you will never understand the power of the recreative, powerful God that can transform your life and change you in ways that I cannot explain to you in this short time that I've got. But he can turn your life around in ways that you will never expect. God can make something out of you that you cannot expect that you don't even know is possible, but he will not do it in a half-hearted attempt to find him. Whew. All right? Thank you. All right, so we need to find it. All right, I, I, got, I, got, I got to move on because I'm almost out of time. All right, Genesis chapter 32. I love Genesis. What an incredible book. We did, we've done some studies on the book of Genesis. There is so much in this book. Just incredible story. Genesis chapter 32, verse 22. So uh, Jacob and, and his family and all were there, and he sent his family and all of his, he sent everybody kind of away. And he found, he was alone. He found himself alone on the, other, on, the, on the side of the brook, and he kind of sent everybody, the rest of his family alone. And he was there. And then the Bible says that he was, began to wrestle with a man. The best we can know, it was either an angel, and we're assuming it was an angel. We don't really know, but it was some kind of an angelic, it was some kind of a spiritual thing. And he began to wrestle with this sp spiritual angel or person or whatever, and he's wrestling with them. And this angel is, decides to try to get, is trying to get away. He's like, that's enough, you know, I'm, 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 I'm out of here, I'm done. Whatever was going on, he's trying to get away. And Jacob's like, nope, I'm not letting go. I'm not going to let go. And so he's hanging on. He's like, I'm not letting go. I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let go. And the Bible says that, that he reached over and he touched his 
the, the hip or his thigh and he kicked his hip out of socket. I don't know about you, but I probably would have let go. Now his leg is out. And he says, I'm not letting go until you bless me. So he's still hanging on. What a... And so this angelic being blesses Jacob and changes Jacob's name to a name that you're going to recognize right away. And he called him Israel. And he said, you'll be the father of a great nation. Israel had 12 sons. We know them as the 12 tribes of Israel. The descendants of Jacob who wrestled with God, we know as Jews. Although they're more correctly Israelites. They are the sons of Israel. Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until you move for me. Okay? It's the same message I've been sharing with you. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to get mine. And I'm not going to let go until I do. Listen, he did. He got it. There is an Israel. There is a great nation. And, 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 and God did what he said he would do. And God fulfilled the promise that he made in that little field with just the two of them there. Because one man refused to let go. And I'm telling you, I, I, I'm going to guarantee you, if you will seek for God and, and look for him and try to find him and dig in and, and not let go until you get what it is you need from God and you begin to dig in and f to find God with all that's within you, you'll find God in a major way. Did you know, I, I love this statement, it's powerful. You have right now, some of you are saying, listen, did you know that you have in your life at this very moment, all of God you want? Because if you wanted more, you would go get more. And if you don't have much God in your life, it's because you don't really want much God in your life. I'm not coming against you. I'm not telling you. You're, I'm just telling you that, that you get all that you want. And if you're satisfied with where your life is, have fun with that, okay? That's your deal. That's not my deal, but I'm not. I'm not satisfied with where I'm at, and I want more. And because I want more, I'm willing to, I'm gonna pour my heart out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna worship. I'm gonna worship harder. I'm gonna pray harder. I'm gonna seek him harder. I'm gonna read my word harder. I'm gonna do all of those things because I want more, and I recognize that if I'm gonna find God, it's going to require a little bit of searching from my part. In Luke, and I'm gonna wrap this up, and this is it, in Luke chapter 18, uh, Jesus began to speak to his disciples about praying. And, and he began to say to them, he said, he said listen, uh, you know, there was a woman who, who needed, he said, he said, gave them a, a story to show them that men should always pray. In Luke chapter 18. He said, there's a woman who wanted avenge, you know, and she's going to bug the king. If you, uh, you know, these are, are really common stories, so, you know, if you've heard it a thousand times, I'm sorry. But he he, he goes on to tell this story about her and that she was trying to get this, this king to do it and he wouldn't do it. And finally he did it because he was tired of hearing her. You know, she's bugging him, bugging him, bugging him, bugging him. He just got tired of it. So he just revenged her because he's just tired of hearing her. All right. And then Jesus goes on about verse six and he says, hear what the unjust says. And he said, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bears long with them. I tell you, that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on earth? Shall he find faith on earth? Listen to me. There is no reason to have faith for something you already have. Come on. I don't need faith for something I already have. I don't need to be hoping for something I have, right? The bottom line is this. I want more of God. I want more of God. I need more of God. I need to be empowered by God. And it is directly attached to my willingness to surrender my heart and my life and do my part to seek his face directly attached 
And the amount of your willingness to look for him will determine the amount of him you find. Okay? We need him. I need him. I need his empowerment. I need his change. Listen, if I'm speaking to you today, I'm wrapping this up. I'm done. If I've spoke to you at all, if you need God in your life, if you need God, you need a change, you need God to do something drastically for you, okay? Listen to me. He will. I can't, I'm not promising you that he's going to snap lightning from heaven and change your situation tomorrow, okay? I didn't promise you that. What I am going to promise is that if you will seek him and try to find him, well, I don't know where to start. Well, me, you know, then just start where you're at. Tell him that. God, I have no idea where to start. Good enough. All right? That's a good place to start. Open the Bible and say, God, show me who you are. Teach me who you are. And then begin to seek after him. And if you will seek after him, he will begin to change your situation. Okay? He will. Wherever you're at today, I want you to get this one thing. Okay? I know you've heard maybe a thousand times. It's free. It's free. It's free. And free gets you about this much. But if you'll surrender your heart to him, and I'm not talking about your money. Please don't, don't put me there. I'm not talking about your money. I'm talking about you. Okay? You start to put your heart to say, I want to find you, God. You'll find him, and he'll change your life. All right? Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for this morning, God. You're a God who has great plans for us. The Bible says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. I've got great plans. I know that as you look in this building this morning, you have great plans for every man, woman that is here. You want to do something with them. You have a whole new life for them. You have a whole great big plan for them. And God, we are hindered. Not because you don't have plans, not because you're not powerful enough, not because you're not willing. Not, we're, hindered, we're not hindered at all because of any lack on your part. We are hindered, God, in many cases by an unwillingness to surrender us to you and say, do it in me. We are, we are hindered by an unwillingness to pay the price and God, I don't want that to be me this morning. God, I don't want to go, I don't want to go through this life and miss out on anything because I wouldn't pray enough, because I wouldn't read my word enough, because I wouldn't seek you hard enough. I don't want to miss out on one moment with you, God. I don't. And I pray that you would help and empower us and teach us in Jesus' name. Amen.